Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Fitzek, and I am the Associate Vice President uh, of Community Services for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we start today's session, I'd like to go over a few reminders. Um, first, please remember that each patient's treatment and condition is unique, and the content presented in this session um, should not be used uh, as a substitute for professional medical advice. Um, in all cases, patients and caregivers should consult their healthcare providers. Um, also remember that where you are on your journey of living with primary immunodeficiency may differ from that other person. Uh, in this session, the severity of PIs can vary, and we ask that you are supportive and respectful of one another as fellow members of the IDF community. Um, finally, questions will be answered at the end of the presenter's talk. Um, you can submit your questions in the question box located at the bottom of the screen, and the presenter will answer as many questions as possible during the session time. Uh, and so now it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our breakout session, Bone Marrow Transplantation and Gene Therapy Now and the Future. Uh, this session will be presented by Dr. Jennifer Puck. Dr. Puck is a professor of immunology at University of California, San Francisco, where she cares for immunology patients and has a basic and translational research program focusing on identifying genes and finding better treatments for severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, um, and other rare human immune disorders. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Puck. Well, good morning, everybody uh, out there in video land. And uh, I'm really honored and, and pleased to be asked to uh, share some thoughts with you this morning about bone marrow transplantation and gene therapy. And what I'm going to do is start with a little bit of general information and then zero down on specifics um, having to do with SCID and with a particular type of SCID for gene therapy, just to illustrate um, the important uh, aspects of what you have to think about as you try to use these approaches for people with all kinds of immune uh, deficiencies. So I realize that uh, everybody wants to know, when are we going to do bone marrow transplants or gene therapy for CVID or for my disorder, whatever it is. Um, and, and so these general uh, aspects will apply. And, and then the specific things that I talk about are also uh, things that have to be thought through and dealt with with every single uh, different disease. So first of all, uh, some aspects of hematopoietic cell transplantation. So we talk about hematopoietic stem cells and the definition of a stem cell for us is it's a long lived cell that is usually just sitting there being very quiet, but when called upon, it can do two things. One is it can divide and keep renewing itself. Uh, so for the whole life of the person, it, it uh, keeps supplying new versions of itself. And the second thing which is important that it can do is in addition to replicating itself, it can divide unequally so that it gives rise to different cell lineages that can mature into different types of cells. And so we're particularly concerned with the uh, blood forming stem cells, which we call hematopoietic uh, stem cells, or and uh, so we re refer to hematopoietic cell transplantation or gene therapy. And this approach can cure uh, disorders that are caused by problems with those stem cells or with the lineages that arise from them, um, such as defects of T, B, and NK lymphocytes, uh, defects of neutrophils, multi-lineage uh, immune defects, but importantly, not uh, the kinds of disorders that arise from uh, 
problems in other organs. For example, if there is thymic insufficiency, then T cells can't mature even if the bone marrow is producing stem cells that differentiate toward the T cell lineage. They get stuck in the thymus. And similarly, there are other conditions where, uh, for example, with autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease, um, the problem might be from autoimmune cells coming from the bone marrow, but it might also involve cells of the intestinal lining themselves. And so, so those things are not going to be fixed if you uh, do a hematopoietic uh, cell transplant or gene therapy. So, uh, and then the next important thing is that the donor cells we're putting in, uh, and, and the idea is to take cells from a healthy person and put them in the bone marrow of the, uh, of the person with the problem. So those healthy cells take up residence and they uh, give rise to their um, uh, lineages and, and cure the problem. So the, however, these donor cells have to be accepted by the patient bone marrow. And T cells and natural killer cells mediate rejection of incoming cells. And this is why SCID has been the most successful and sort of the pioneer uh, condition for bone marrow transplantation because in the absence of T and NK cells, there is no rejection. So, so that whole problem uh, just doesn't occur in SCID, whereas it's a big problem in chronic granulomatous disease or uh, X-linked A gamma globulinemia or other kinds of conditions where you have T cell immunity. Another important thing is that there are these, the places that these stem cells live, they're called niches or niches if you're uh, pronouncing like French. Um, these are little uh, areas in the bone marrow surrounded by, by nourishing uh, specialized cells. And um, these little niches have to be open in order to allow the new incoming cells to sit down and form a durable uh, population or a durable graft. And you may need some kind of conditioning with chemotherapy or other approaches to remove the host defective stem cells and make space for these new incoming cells. And so that's a, a principle no matter what uh, disease we're considering. Also, uh, then the final thing on this slide is that the patient has to be able to undergo the treatment. So if, uh, and this is, this is a big sort of catch-22 problem these days, if a patient has a gene mutation and we are worried that the future is going to be very difficult with infections or other problems, then doctors may recommend um, a transplant sooner rather than later. But on the other hand, uh, you know, nobody wants to undertake the risk of a transplant for a healthy looking child or person. Uh, but if you wait and infections and organ damage occur, that makes the transplant more difficult. And um, you can get to the point where infections or poor nutrition or organ damage not only uh, compound um, the problems of, of transplant, but may actually make uh, the risks too big to consider. And a special case of this is the very young, very small infants uh, who are now being picked up by newborn screening. And newborns have very special uh, problems that have to be considered uh, when you're thinking about transplants. So I already mentioned that SCID has been a pioneer disease just because of its nature of not having the kind of cells that can mediate rejection. So this uh, immune deficiency was first recognized in the 1950s, very soon after the description of X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, uh, because these babies who were described by Walter Hitzig in Switzerland, they had all the problems of the XLA uh, child or, or children who'd been described, 
but they had additional problems. They had uh, fungal infection called throughout the tongue. They had very poor growth and they just didn't survive uh, infancy because of their uh, recurrent and, and cumulative infections. And this was actually very instrumental in helping uh, immunologists of the day discover the different roles of B cells and T cells, B cells making antibodies and T cells being sort of the directors of the whole orchestra of the immune system and having antifungal and antiviral activity, but also uh, making cytokines and, and uh, running the show. So SCID was the first, uh, not only immune deficiency, but first disease to be successfully treated uh, by bone marrow transplant. And this was a boy with X-linked SCID who got a transplant from his HLA identical sister. And uh, he's grown up and he's a, a perfectly healthy um, uh, father and professional. So this shows that, that uh, um, these transplants can be curative. SCID was also the pioneer in the 1970s up to 2000 um, to introduce transplants beyond HLA-matched siblings. And these became much more common for cancer, actually, for leukemia than, than for immune deficiencies, just because uh, different kinds of cancers are more frequent. SCID was also the very first uh, disease treated with enzyme replacement therapy. And that particular kind of SCID is adenosine deaminase or ADA SCID, uh, where the enzyme can be purified and injected into uh, the patients to replace the function of the enzyme that they're missing. So, and I think everybody's aware that SCID was the first human disease that was treated successfully by gene therapy. Um, this was not uh, sort of a single shot deal, but, but uh, trials of ADA and X-linked SCID gene therapy have been going on for over 20 years. Initially, the X-linked SCID uh, transplants looked good, but had a very significant setback when leukemia developed in a, um, a large proportion of the patients who were treated. And that caused uh, uh, immunologists and scientists to go back and redesign the vectors to try to uh, uh, minimize that risk. So, and finally, SCID is the first uh, condition for which newborn screening has been instituted um, for a primary immune disease. And so that has given us um, the opportunity to treat infants um, early in life before they get infections at all. And this slide just uh, reminds us how all of the states in the United States, they not only voted and turned red or pink or Blue, uh, but they turned green when they started newborn screening. And um, uh, this slide shows the darker green colors are the ones who started on the earlier side and lighter green more recently. But everybody uh, has had screening since the end of 2018. And this slide also shows the yellow dots and this pink dot in San Francisco where I am. Um, uh, showing the sites of the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium. And that's a big mouthful, so we say PIDTC. Um, this is a consortium of many different sites uh, who have banded together to try to figure out what are the best ways to treat SCID, what are the best kinds of transplants to do, but not only SCID, also chronic granulomatous disease, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, and uh, immune dysregulatory diseases and, and uh, others. So um, we're, uh, this group is funded through uh, 2024 now, trying to figure out how to pivot from just recording um, what experience has been at all these centers to actually um, launching clinical trials that we're very excited about. And one thing that the PIDTC has done is collect information about how SCID babies have been treated. Uh, and this graph you can see uh, starts in 2010 and goes up through 
2016, we could extend it to the present. And the green line shows the percentage of babies with SCID who are identified by newborn screening, as opposed to the red line, which shows the ones who uh, were identified by developing infections. So we're very pleased with this success of newborn screening, um, uh, showing that, that we can now, um, in the presence of screening, be taking care of babies who are still healthy and don't have uh, serious infectious complications for the most part. One thing that has happened with this um, is that we've had to actually change the definition of SCID. So if you open up a textbook and look at SCID definitions, you'll see absent T cells, recurrent infections, weight loss, um, serious bacterial, viral, fungal infections, and so on. And the thing is with newborn screening, um, we realize we're not seeing those things. So I've crossed them out here. And what we identify is absent or very low T cell receptor excision circles or TREX on the newborn screen. Um, these are diagnosed in the first weeks of life. We now know the incidence of SCID more accurately than before. It's about one in 60,000 births. So it's still very rare, but more common than we initially thought. And we have a new definition that is based uh, not on the infections, because we don't want to see those at all, but uh, it's based on, on having certain numbers of T cells, um, possibly maternal um, T cells that have been transferred the, to the baby and not eliminated, and also uh, absent T cell function, such as proliferation to this um, PHA or phytohemagglutinin. And the newborn screening has revealed that the, um, uh, the proportions of SCID due to different genes is not exactly the same as we had thought when we were um, uh, only able to recognize SCID once uh, patients were referred to transplant centers. And we think that's because now we're, we're actually catching um, a fair number of cases which previously were missed and infants died. But uh, one thing we are very aware of now is all the different genotypes of SCID that are shown on the pie chart here for California in the last, in a, a publication that we um, put out two years ago. And, and uh, we found out that when you're doing a treatment such as a bone marrow transplant, or certainly if you're doing gene therapy, the gene matters. So um, the gene can, can be um, requiring a different approach or a different kind of treatment based on um, which gene it is and which particular spelling mistake or mutation is um, present in the gene. Because some of them are a little bit leaky and make a few T cells, well, that's a problem because T cells can mediate rejection. Um, some kinds of skid have natural killer cells, again, that they, they can uh, resist engraftment. And uh, we wanna know, are B cells present? And if so, are they functional? Because if not, we need to be sure to get the stem cells fixed uh, to the degree that, that uh, B cell function will, um, will develop and, and the person won't be stuck on uh, IVIG for the rest of their life. Um, we also consider things about the donor. Um, is there an available donor? The best donor is a matched sibling, but only about 10% or even fewer of uh, skid infants have a matched sibling these days. Um, that's different in large uh, families in other parts of the world where there might be common ancestry or, or um, uh, and, and then uh, the HLA types might be much more matched within a family. Um, and again, we need to think about the different kinds of treatments. Is enzyme replacement available, uh, which could be a bridge to uh, a perfect donor or to gene therapy? And can we consider gene therapy? And gene therapy is only going to be available if we know what the gene is. So, so that is something that has um, really grown hand in hand with more uh, DNA sequencing. 
So what we're seeing, this is again some data from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, PIDTC, showing overall survival, OS, uh, by whether or not a person was infected um, at the time of their transplant. And you can see this very flat line showing very few babies failed to survive when they went into the transplant infection free. Whereas in the presence of active infection, uh, the survival went down around 79 or 80 percent. And this is not old um, uh, literature data. This is current modern supportive care. This is really the best we can do. And so, so the moral here is that newborn screening or avo avoiding infections um, is very, very important. And if a person does have infections, we want to see if we can manage them or tune, tune things up <clears throat> uh, to get people infection-free going into their transplant. So this is another survival curve, and it shows um, uh, that genes matter when it comes to survival as well. So these are different skid genes shown in the different colors, and the overall survival, again, is uh, shown in the graph. You can see the highest survival is for the X-linked IL-2RG gene and, a, and the JAK3 gene, which is um, uh, uh, encodes a protein that's just next step down from uh, the X-link gene. Also, the RAG and uh, IL-7 receptor genes have very, very good survival, and survival is less good for ADA, the adenosine deaminase deficiency, and worst for um, this gene called DCLRE1C, or uh, the easier name for it is Artemis. And um, one of the reasons why Artemis um, survival is so poor is that this is a DNA repair enzyme, which is needed really for, for repairing DNA breaks in every cell, not just cells of the immune system. So it is absolutely essential for uh, the T and B cell maturation of their uh, receptors, but um, it, it confers sensitivity to radiation and to the alkylating agents that are used for chemotherapy. So uh, uh, chemotherapy is especially toxic to these uh, individuals. And another problem is that it's a T minus B minus NK plus skid, uh, and so the natural killer cells tend to resist engraftment, as I already mentioned. So it makes transplants uh, particularly difficult. And this, some of this information is summarized here. The bottom line is even with a matched sibling donor, uh, T cell immunity is often incomplete with transplants uh, for Artemis skid. And alternative uh, donors who aren't matched siblings have a high level of graft rejection and a high level of graft versus host disease, which I didn't mention before, but this is the incoming cells. Um, if they are not matched to the um, patient, can actually attack the patient's tissues and cause problems in every organ uh, such as the lungs, the intestine, um, the eyes, and so on. So uh, all these things together, um, for one thing, this just shows you as an example that different skid genes are different in their survival and other characteristics. But this is also something that led uh, Dr. Cowan uh, and myself at UCSF to want to develop gene therapy uh, for Artemis skid so that we wouldn't have to have all these uh, extra problems when the transplants were done from other individuals. So um, what is it that makes gene therapy attractive? Well, for one thing, you're taking out the patient's own cells, you put a correct copy of them, the gene into those cells, and you give the patient's own cells back. So you don't have any problems with rejection or graft versus host disease. So you just uh, uh, can basically forget about those very serious issues. Um, I did mention before that 
previous gene therapy had uh, for X-Link Skid, and actually now in the last uh, week we heard about Artemis, uh, I, I'm sorry, about um, ADA-deficient Skid, a patient got leukemia um, after being treated with gene therapy. And that's because these uh, the at the ends of the genes, there are these um, segments that are labeled here, um, U3R uh, and U5. Those are the long terminal repeats at each end of the vector um, that are, um, they're imported from retroviruses that the uh, vector is derived from. And in the original vector, these were from a mouse leukemia virus. They were very active and they actually turned on expression of genes adjacent to where this, um, these sequences got inserted into the host DNA. You want uh, insertion into host chromosomes because that's what makes this therapy long lasting. Um, and, and so you want this to last their whole life, but you don't want these uh, long terminal repeat sequences at the end to uh, cause leukemia. So this is um, the current kind of gene therapy vector. And I'm showing the one for X-Link Skid, uh, sorry, for Artemis Skid here, but it's an example of how gene therapy vectors are designed today to avoid these problems. So things uh, are, some of the aspects are, we've, we've uh, taken out the U3 end uh, of the long terminal repeat on, repeat on one side, and um, the X on the other side shows uh, putting stop codons and changes in it to inactivate it. So this is designed not to um, activate adjacent genes, which could cause leukemia. And the um, gene inside, which is a human Artemis gene, instead is turned on by the natural promoter called APRO um, that is uh, taken out of the human DNA right um, at the five prime end or right adjacent to the coding sequence. And there are other uh, modifications that are introduced into this type of vector to increase its um, expression, but keep it regulated in a physiologic manner and prevent it from causing leukemia. Now, is this a sure thing? We don't know because this therapy is new and patients are going to have to be followed for many years um, to, to make sure whether leukemia or other complications um, occur. Now, how do, you, how do you figure out whether you're ready to put uh, a gene therapy um, vector into a patient? So you have to do preclinical tests, and this is one example where um, a preclinical in vitro T cell differentiation assay was used, starting with cells from an Artemis skid patient. So these cells were purified, and CD34 is a, a um, cell surface marker which enriches for those bone marrow stem cells we talked about. So we enrich for those and then put them in a cell culture system that encourages development of T cells and B cells from those stem cells. And um, this shows that when we took the patient cells and we put in a control vector that isn't, um, it doesn't add anything to them, we get um, blank um, quadrants in the graphs on the right side, as you can see. But when we put in the clinical vector with the Artemis gene encoded, you can see that um, all those little blue dots represent cells that are developing and maturing in the T cell lineage. So these are making CD3 cells, which are T cells, um, CD4 and CD8, which are helper and cytotoxic uh, mature T cells. So this is one of the pieces of evidence that tells you you're ready uh, to do gene therapy. And a gene therapy trial uh, always uh, needs to be approved by the FDA and has um, all sorts of uh, 
um, details that I don't think we have time to go into. This is a sort of a timeline showing patients um, uh, enrolling and then their cells are harvested from their bone marrow or peripheral blood. They get the correct copy of the gene added and then uh, that product is frozen until sterility and other checks are done. And then when the, when the uh, uh, corrected cells are approved, then the patient gets a low dose of busulfan chemotherapy to make space in those bone marrow niches. And then the cells are thawed and uh, just infused into an IV because they know where to go. They home to the bone marrow into those niches. So we're, uh, we're sort of running out of time. And I want to show this is just the first uh, seven infants who've been enrolled in this Artemis gene therapy study. There is a um, Navajo and Apache Indian um, founder mutation. So some of our patients have this common type of Artemis skid, but we also have uh, Caucasian, Vietnamese, uh, Hispanic, and other kinds of um, backgrounds. And the patients have been treated. Um, these are were discovered all by newborn screening. So they were treated between um, uh, two and four months of age. And one very important thing is the amount of busulfan that they're given is not a consistent dose. And that's because babies have a very variable metabolism. And um, uh, some babies require more drug to have the same tissue exposure, and some require a lot less. So it's very important uh, for doing gene therapy or transplants to um, monitor tissue exposure, not just milligrams per kilogram. And I'm going to finish up just with some early results from this trial. So here you can see uh, the first, these first seven babies all in each in a different color. And the numbers of T cells are rising. And this dotted line in each case shows the uh, normal uh, number for age. So we are detecting B cells for the first time in these babies and uh, helper and uh, cytotoxic cells are developing and their function is normal as you can see here. Um, it's very important to look at whether we're getting clonal proliferation, which could be an early sign of leukemia. So this graph is showing everything in gray is an insertion site that was completely unique and not amplified at all, um, uh, showing the great majority of, of the um, insertion sites we were able to isolate from cells uh, obtained from this was our first uh, enrolled patient. And another thing that's very important is, are we producing the diversity of cells that is going to make um, a good normal immune system? So this diagram just shows a T cell here with its receptors for antigen and the very diverse uh, sequences that have to develop are in this, these orange little hinge places in the molecule. And we sequence those using deep sequencing uh, to make sure how diverse they are. And that is an indication of whether they're competent uh, to sort of face the world and give everybody normal immunity. So we're comparing to, this is uh, on the left, a healthy infant cord blood, and on the right, a healthy adult volunteer. And you can see <clears throat> every little dot is a different um, sequence. And so there's a huge variety of sequences uh, in this these normal immune systems. And the, uh, this is a, uh, this is our first patient we treated actually. Um, the pretreatment diversity showed only three dots at all. Uh, and for all we know, those were from the mother. Um, however, by three months, you can see a lot of diversity developing in the first T cells being made um, after gene therapy. And by six months, this pattern looks just as good as the um, adult controls 
or the cord blood control. So um, I'm going to end here and just say um, defects that are intrinsic to lymphocytes and their precursors or to other uh, bone marrow derived cells can be treated by transplant or gene therapy. The best donor is a matched sibling, but we have to use alternative donors most of the time. Um, we are still working out the best transplant regimens, not only for SCID, but for other conditions, because we want to minimize the toxicity of uh, uh, um, chemotherapy while being sure we get durable stem cell grafts. And I think um, you can read these slides, and I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pak. Um, always informative to have you here. Um, there are a couple questions, as you can imagine. Um, the first one um, is from an individual. Um, for an adult with CBID with a lot of autoimmune involvement, are there any novel therapies, repurposed cancer medications, et cetera, other than I? GG replacement available that would justify the expense of getting gene testing done? Well, so first of all, a common variable immunodeficiency can be caused by single gene uh, disorders, but um, only about somewhere between, in the different uh, studies, somewhere between 10 and 30% of cases can be associated with a specific gene. And 70% or so of the time, uh, uh, we don't find a gene. Even though, having said that, some patients with CVID have now been treated with a bone marrow transplant from uh, a healthy matched individual. The risks of that kind of transplant are high because CVID patients do have some T cell immunity. Um, but the benefits can be uh, that you get rid of the, immune, the autoimmune cells. Um, there are also a lot of new medications to fight uh, autoimmunity, but many of these um, don't require um, uh, a specific gene. I mean, it's sort of a um, try it, and if it works, fine, but, but um, these therapies can be tried without knowing a specific gene defect. So this is a question that would need to be um, uh, addressed with your immunologist. Thank you, Dr. Puck. Um, the second question, um, have there been successful stem cell transplants for patients who have WDR1 gene mutation? Uh, so that's a very specific question. I would have to go to the literature to look that up. Um, and it, there may have been uh, transplants done that have not been published yet that I'm not aware of. So, so I don't really have an answer for that one. Gotcha. Um, uh, we have quite a few people who are just saying thank you so much for your talk, um, just to let you know. Um, what are the current recommendations regarding vaccines post-transplant for skid patients? So that's a great question because uh, every, uh, so skid patients, because they have no specific antibody production, get placed on uh, IgG before and during their transplant. It takes about four months after the transplant to start three to four months to start to see appreciable numbers of T cells, and they come in faster than B cells. The B cells can be delayed by six months to a year or even more, even two years. So um, we start to look for B cells produced by the donor uh, in most of the skid genotypes and we start to look for those somewhere around six to 12 months after the transplant. When we see donor-derived B cells, we figure those should be functional. And then we look for antibodies that those B cells might be producing. And uh, those antibodies include um, uh, isohemagglutinins, which are IgM, because of course you're giving the person IgG for protection. So so you can't just measure the IgG. 
We look for um, the level of IgM, whether isohemagglutinins are made, and also whether the, the individual is making IgA, which is not in the infusions. And um, when those things happen, then you can think about a trial off of IVIG or, or sub-Q IgG. Um, and if, um, if this is in December or January and it's, it's my patient, I wait until after the winter virus season. So then uh, along about March, I would stop giving extra IgG, wait for about three months and see um, then if the person starts to respond to the baby shots and vaccines um, that they've missed out on before. And if they respond well, then uh, we can keep them off of uh, supplementation. Great, thank you. Um, is the bone marrow transplant procedure for children the same or different as for adults? Uh, so the procedure is the same. Um, Adults need more cells, obviously. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that there is a cord blood um, uh, repository where cord blood has been donated. And if a baby needs a transplant and it happens to match or match pretty well with something in the uh, cord blood repository, you can get cells from that source. But usually that's not enough cells to uh, do a transplant for an adult. Also, a person who is an adult needing a transplant uh, is having gotten to all the way to adulthood, probably has some T cell and maybe NK cell immunity. So that needs to be uh, suppressed with chemotherapy or some, some mechanism in order to get a graft um, to work. So adults generally need some chemotherapy uh, or there are new ways being tried to make space in those bone marrow niches, but um, you have to worry about the host uh, T cell and NK cell populations fighting the graft and have to get rid of those in adults. Got it. Um, what is gene editing? Is it different from gene replacement therapy? So that's a great question. Gene editing is different. Um, gene editing is a new technology, and uh, Jennifer Doudna just got the Nobel Prize with her um, uh, collaborator, uh, Charpentier, to uh, discover this, this um, phenomenon. These are, these are enzymes called CRISPR that actually um, can cut DNA at specific locations. And so um, these, these uh, enzymes can be harnessed to make cuts and then repair specific places in, in uh, the DNA. So a patient's mutation, which is a, a spelling mistake in their DNA, those mistakes can be individually corrected using this gene editing technology. Um, but beyond that, it also is possible to make a cut in a certain place in the DNA and then insert correct uh, copies of the gene. Um, so this gene editing is um, extending the, our ability to um, uh, make modifications, but keep all of the physiologic um, uh, regulatory sequences intact. So we're very hopeful in the future, this could become um, a more widely used mechanism. It's being tried in uh, sickle cell and a couple of other uh, specific um, uh, conditions, including HIV right now, but hasn't been used in SCID yet. Cool, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions, but uh, we the, the folks that asked them, we will take note of them and try to get you some answers. Um, our time has unfortunately come to an end, um, but I want to please join me in thanking Dr. Puck for joining us today. Um, we are really lucky at IDF and you as a community to have Dr. Puck as 
um, part of our community. I mean, not only did she wake up at eight o'clock, well, probably seven o'clock this morning um, to give this presentation, but she's involved in so much in giving her time to IDF and so generous with that time. Um, and so much gratitude, Dr. Puck, for uh, joining us today. Um, appreciate it. You can't probably see everybody clapping, but we are. Um, okay. Uh, well, stay, you, stay safe and thank you to the IDF. Thank you so much. Um, and we have our final keynote at noon, the power of plasma, and then closing remarks by John Boyle. So thank you so much to everybody. Take care.